So, hey guys, welcome to join our live sharing talk. Today, our topic is, so you want to build an antivirus engine. And we'll be demonstrating our engine, Quark. It is an obfuscation neck like Android malware scoring system. So, my name is Kun Yu Chen. I am a security researcher and a founder of Quark Engine. And we also have another speaker, Jin Wei. He's the co-founder of Quark Engine. And he gave talks in security conferences like HITV and DEF CON. So um, this is the uh, outline. Number one, we will, get, uh, we will introduce our malware scoring system. And number two, we will show you how we designed the Delvic Bico loader. And number three, we will go through two cases of real malware analysis using Quark Engine. And the last thing, yes, the future works. We still have a lot of things to do. All right, so uh, let's introduce the malware scoring system. As we know, when developing a malware analysis engine, it is important to have a scoring system. However, those systems are either business secret or too complicated. Therefore, we decided to create a simple but solid one and take that as a challenge. And since we wanted to design a novel scoring system, we stopped reading and decoding what other people do in the field of cybersecurity because we don't want our ideas to be subjected to the existing systems. So we started to find ideas in fields other than cyber security. And luckily, we found one. Yes, the best practice we found is the criminal law. So when sentence a penalty for a criminal, the judge weights the penalties based on the criminal, the criminal law. And after decoding the law, we find principles behind it. And we developed a scoring system for Android malware. There are only eight principles decoded from the criminal law. And I'll go through it in the following slide. Now, let's see principle number one. A malware crime consists of action and targets. In the criminal law, the definition of a crime consists of action and targets. For example, steal money and kill people. So with this principle in mind, we developed the definition of a crime for Android malware. And the definition is the malware crime consists of action and targets. For example, steal photos or steal your banking account passwords. Now, let's see uh, principle number two. We consider that the loss of fame is greater than the loss of wealth. In the criminal law, physical body injury is more serious than psychological injury. So the principle we decoded here is when things are hard to recover, we consider it a felony. With this principle decoded, we developed our second principle. We consider the loss of fame is greater than the loss of wealth because it's easier to make your money back than rebuild 
your reputation. Okay, now let's see uh, principle number three, arithmetic sequence. In the criminal law, when the murderer is sentenced 20 years in prison and a robber is sentenced seven years in prison for his crime. Have you ever think about why 20 and seven years? Why the number? And we found no obvious principle in the criminal law. So we use arithmetic sequence to weight the penalty of each crime. For example, the penalty weight of Y1, which is uh, still banking account password, is 10. And Y2, still photos from the cell phone, is 20. And the penalty weight for Y3 is 30, etc. So now let's see the most important part of the scoring system. We created a, an author theory, which consists of three principles. There are principle number four, number five, and number six. So let's first look at principle number four. The later the stage, the more we're sure that the crime is practiced. And as I mentioned, uh, as mentioned in uh, chapter four of Taiwan criminal law, each crime consists of a sequence of behaviors. And those behaviors can be categorized in a specific order. So let's take murder, for example. In stage one, determined, it means somebody decide to kill someone. And in stage two, conspiracy. It means that he or she started to make a plan for the murder. And in stage three, preparation. It means buying stops, for example, weapons or ranging services for the murder plan. And in stage four, start. It means when things are all set, the murderer takes action and is on the way to kill someone. Practice, the last stage, stage five. It means the murderer has pulled a trigger and shoots someone. So as we can see here, the later the stage, the more we are sure that the crime is practiced. So, with this principle in mind, we developed Android malware crime order theory. And in this theory, we also have five stages for a crime. For example, if a malware tries to send out your location data by using SMS, in stage one, we would check if related permission is requested by the malware. And then we will check if the key native API is called. And in stage three, we will see if certain combination of native API exist. And then we will check if the APIs are called in a specific order. Finally, we check if the APIs are handling the same register. Okay, so now uh, you can see from this picture, this is a two dimensional map for Android malware crime. And for the crimes, we put them in Y axis. And for each crime, we use X axis to see if the evidence, uh, to see the evidence we caught for this crime. 
So x5, y1 means in crime number one, we have found native APIs that are called in the correct sequence and they're handling the same register. And X3, Y5, it means in crime number five, we have found certain combination of native APIs that are used in, in this APK. <clears throat> so now let's look at uh, principle number five. The more evidence we caught, the more penalty weight we give. So we give stage two more weights than stage one. And we give stage three more weights than stage two, etc. Okay, principle number six, proportional sequence. As we decode it from the criminal law, the later the stage, the more we are sure that the crime is practiced. So we consider proportional sequence, for example, two to the power of n to present such principle in our scoring system. All right, principle number seven, crimes are independent events. So for simplicity, we assume crimes are independent events and penalty weight can be added up directly. So this is an uh, example of adding up two crimes. In the malware, we find two crimes. There are stealing photos and stealing your banking account password. So the calculation of the total penalty weight actually is quite simple. For each crime, we use penalty weight of crime to multiply the proportion of caught evidence and add up the results of the two. The last principle, principle number eight, threshold generate system. So after calculating the total penalty weight for the malware, we need to have threat level threshold so that we can tell which threat level does the malware fit in. Unfortunately, we can't find them in the criminal law, but we know we need to design a threshold generate system for that not just give any number by intuition. So we decided that threshold for each threat level is the sum of the same proportion of caught evidence multiplies the penalty weight of crimes. Yeah, we know this is not a perfect one, but we are sure that we build a foundation for future optimization. All right, now uh, let's talk about the uh, design logic of Delvic Vico Loader and my partner, Junwei. He will take care of this part. Hello everyone, my name is Junwei and I will take care of this part. So now, Let's talk about the design logic of Delphi Bicode Loader. Our Delphi Bicode Loader is actually the implementation of the Android malware crime order theory. We implement every stage of the theory. There are five stages. The first three stages are easy. We simply use APIs in another open source tool, Android Guard. 
to increment the first three stages. As I just mentioned, the implementation of the first three stages are easy. But in stage four, we need to do a little bit more. So, before the implementation, we need to know what does stage four do. In stage four, we find the calling sequence of native APIs and check if they are called in a specific order. For example, if a malware sends out your location data by SNS, then first it will call native API get cell location to get your location data. And then it will call native API send text message to send your location data by SNS. Normally, native APIs are work in functions. So we trace back to see which function is cross-referenced from the native APIs. And we call those functions the parent function. And we will keep tracing back until we find the mutual parent function for both the native APIs. Here is the example. Send text message is called by send SNS, which is the parent function of send text message. And get cell location is called by get location, which is the parent function of get cell location. And if we keep tracing back, we will see that both send SNS and get location shares the same parent function, which is send message. And after we find the mutual parent function, we will scan through a small like code of the mutual parent function and check which function is called first. So this is the small like call of send message. We can see that get location is called first to get location data of the cell phone. And the send SNS is called to send out the location data. In stage four, we found out that our design can also overcome the obfuscation techniques used by the malware. When applying obfuscation techniques, function except native APIs are renamed. This has meant the decompile source code hard to read for human. The machines can still run the code because the logic of the code remains the same. Here is the example. When applying obfuscation techniques, native API send text message is called by function k. And function k is called by function f. The other native API get cell location is called by function e. And both function e and f shares the same parent function, which is a. So you see, 
if you start reading the decompiled source code of A, it will be hard to figure out what is going on there. And by the way, since our goal is to find a mutual parent function, so it doesn't matter how many layers the workers are. Now, let's see the implementation of stage five. Yes, this is the most important part. In stage five, we need to do confirm that if the native APIs are handling the same register. Let's use the same example. Send out your location data by using SNS. So, when native API gets some location is called, it will return the location data of the cell phone. And what we do in stage five is to check if the outer native API sends text message, sends out the location data returned from get cell location. So in stage five, we simulate the CPU operation. We will read line by line of the small like source code and operate like CPUs to get two things. First, the value of every register. Two, the information like functions who have upgraded the same register. To make this happen, we create a self-defined data type and we call it register object. In each register object, we store three kinds of information. Number one, the register name. And number two, the value of the register. And number three, the function who use this register. Let's you see the example. So the register name is V7 and the value of the register is a string. And the string appends the value of string one and the result of function one. And then we can see that the register is used as the input source of the function two. And by the way, when filling in the value of use by which function in a register object, we expand every register by cross referencing outer register object in a table. So for example, by cross referencing, we know that V8 is a string called user location and V3 is a function called get location. As you can see in the lower right corner, the result of get location is appended to the string, which is user location. And the new string is sent out by using function send SNS. In other words, the value of register V7 is generated by using function get location, which has 
negative API 1 in it. And the value is used as an input for a function send SNS, which has negative API 2 in it. So now we prove that by using the register objects, we can check if the APIs are handling the same register. So after we scan through the source core, we will produce lots of register objects. And those register objects will be organized with a two-dimensional Python list. It is a similar idea like hash table. We use it to boost up the read and write of the list. So now, let's see the table. As you can see here, register v4 has three register object. That means in the source core we scan, v4 was used three times. And every time when it was used, we store the present value of the register. And the function who use it if there is one. So basically, the whole table is the history of the registers. So when we finish constructing the table, we then scan through all register objects in the table to check if the native APIs are handling the same register. So now, let's see how to use Quark Engine to analyze the malware. Now, let's get back to Kun Yu. Hi, uh, it's me again. So, in this section, we prepared two malware. One is non-obfuscated, and the other one is obfuscated. And for each malware, we will show how we detect the behavior of the malware with the detection rule. Now, let's see the first malware. This is a non-obfuscated one. We will use the rule in Quark Engine to detect whether if the malware sent out the cell phone's location data by using SMS. So this is the detailed report of Quark Engine. And in this report, the engine shows the detection result of one single malware behavior. Or you can say one single malware crime. So for example, we try to find if the malware sent out your location data by using SMS. In this report, we list out the evidence we found in each stage of the Android malware crime author theory. And this report shows we find evidence in every stage, which means we have 100% sure, we have 100% of confidence that the malware has this behavior. So let's see, in stage one, Permissions like send SMS, access course location, and find location are requested. In the second stage, 
key native APIs like get cell location and send text message are used. And in stage three, we found certain combination of native APIs exist. And in stage four, we found out that in functions like send message and do byte, the APIs are called in the right sequence. And in stage five, in function send message, we found out that those APIs are handling the same register. So now let's think. If you're analyzing this malware and you want to trace the, uh, the compiled source code to see the evidence, how do you do it? Our suggestion is if you are reading our uh, the detailed report generated by Quark Engine, we suggest that you read the report backwards. That means you start reading from stage five. For example, in stage five, we know that inside the function of send message, it has two functions that contains the two native APIs respectively, and they're handling the same register. So you start to locate function, send message, and the decompiled source code. And in stage four, we know that those two functions are called in the right sequence. So we can start to find functions that contains the native APIs and check if they are really called in the right sequence. The information of the two functions and the sequence will be shown in the next version of Quark Engine. So now let's look at the real, real malware example. So as you, you can remember, in the previous slide, we need to locate the function send message in the source code. And we found out that two functions that contains the two native APIs respectively. There are send SMS and get location. And if we dive into the source code of function, get location, we will see that it contains native API get location. And if we dive into the source code of function send SMS, we will see that it contains native API send text message. So the decompiled source code here, it means this malware will first collect your cell phone location data and send it out through SMS. So now let's dive into the source code of get location. As you can see in the source code, it tries to call native API get cell location and return this information at the end of the code. And now let's dive in the source code of send SMS. Native API send text message is used to send out the location information. So that's, that's how we've used the uh, Quark engine to find the uh, elements in a malware. Quite simple, isn't it? Now, Let's look at the second malware. This is an obfuscated one. We will use the rule in Quark Engine to find whether if the malware detect Wi-Fi hotspot by generate by gathering information like 
active network info, and cell phone location. Okay, so as a malware uh, analyst, we read the report backwards. So as you can see in stage five, there are functions like p.a at view.c and af.run. And those functions, uh, they have two functions that contains the native APIs respectively. And they're handling the same register. And in stage four, those two functions are also called in the right sequence in function p.a at view.c and af.run. So, according to the report, we can say that the malware has the behavior of Wi-Fi hotspot detection in three parts of the source code. We can pick any part for further analysis. So we pick function uh, p.a. So now let's see the source code. Let's locate the function p.a. And we found out that two functions that contains the two native APIs respectively. There are ap.a and f.f. And if we dive into the source code of function ap.a, we will see that it contains native API, get active network info. And if we dive into the function f.f, we will see that it contains the native API, get cell location. So the code here means after collecting information from function ap.a and f.f, they send information as an input for function am.a. So now let's dive into the source code of function ap.a. So as you can see in the source code, it tries to call native API, get active network info, and return the related information at some point. Now let's dive into the source code of f.f. Native API get cell location is used to get the cell phone location data. And this information is processed with some other strings. And at the end of this function, it returns the string with the information. As I mentioned earlier, after collecting information from function ap.a and f.f, they use the information as an input for function am.a. And we notice one thing. The function am.a used byte array apple string as one of its input parameters. And we know when seeing byte array output stream, it means the function is probably trying to write the data into a file. So we show again how we use Quark Engine to find evidence of malware activity in the, in, the, in, the, in the binary. So this is amazing, isn't it? So with Quark Engine, malware analysis can really boost up their productivity. All right, the last part, future works. As I mentioned earlier, we still have a lot of things to do. For example, we need to have more detection rules and we need to deal with the uh, .so file and the packed APKs. And we want to have more features of the Delvic bike loader, for example, the feature of downloader. And we also want to apply our scoring system to other binary formats. And the last thing, we probably would change the core library since we use Android God, and since Android God is quite inactive recently. Okay, that's all for today. And if you have any question, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Kunyu. Um, there's no, there's no questions so far. I, I did forget to tell people: Do you use the uh, Zoom? Q&A function. Uh -huh. um, in the meantime, I, I can ask you one thing. So oh, I, I hear a bit of echo, but it's, it's fine. I'll, I'll endure. Um, what, what made you interested in doing this work with the antivirus? Uh, sorry, can you say that again? Because the speaker, uh, the speaker is quiet. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah, no worries. What, what made you interested in this, in this subject? What is the most interesting part? For, for you, yes. Okay. The construction of finding 
the, the process of, of constructing the malware scoring system. And also, uh, we, we have experienced the unexpected part. For example, the, uh, the, the function of this engine, we can find the, uh, we can, we can uh, neglect the obfuscation part. That's, uh, that is unexpected part. So we went through an adventure and we didn't miss something that is unexpected. That's the most interesting part. Nice. Um, Takuya, I see you have your hand raised. I, I, I would ask you to use the Q&A function. Oh, oh okay. we have a question. So are you planning to keep this to Android only or do you plan to look at other platforms? Uh, can I say that again? Sorry. Yeah. Are you planning to keep this uh, on Android only or do you plan to look at any other platforms? Yeah, we, we, we were trying to apply it to other platform for, for example, uh, the, the binary formats of ELF or PE files because we found the, uh, the our, our other theory can apply to other binary formats. We would, we would do that in our future, in the future works. Cool, thank you. Um, all right, so there's no more questions. Thank you again for the talk. Um, and we will be doing a break now. Okay. Thanks so much. So, and I bet people at home are clapping as well. So, yeah. <laughs>